This is 9-11 Freefall. Dale Pierce is my guest tonight. We're going to be talking about our little adventure in front of the Walnut Creek City Council last week and how we're going to be continuing it on at other city councils around the Bay Area, bringing the 9-11 truth message to them, talking about Building 7, asking them to pass that symbolic resolution, calling for a new investigation into that building's destruction on 9-11. We'll be going over that. I'll also be playing that speech that we made last week uh, here on the show before I play the interview. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I traveled across the country this week to D.C. to represent AE 9-11 Truth at the Million Man March. You can hear about that on Kevin Barrett's show, Truth Jihad, which is also here on No Lies Radio. You can find that in the archives. Um, But really quick, I just want to talk about how I had my resolve strengthened During this trip, going through the TSA, yes, the TSA, our friends here in the post-9-11 world, uh, you know, I was told and reminded about the whole issue with the body scanners and the pat-downs, and and I went through the pat-down, and man, they, it is everything the people in the alternative media say it is, and then some. What really got me, though, is when I came home, I I had opened my suitcases up, because I had some suits in there, that I didn't want bunched up any longer than they needed to be. And I, in the dark, just kind of pulled them out really fast and threw them back in the closet. And then the next morning, I found this piece of paper lying next to my suitcase on the floor. It must have been when I pulled my suits out, went flying up and landed on the floor. It says, Notice of Baggage Inspection, Transportation Security Administration. So they went through my bags, too. And you know what? Uh, I'm glad that they did. I'm glad that they did, because I was also carrying an envelope full of Beyond Misinformation booklets and a whole stack of business cards. So I hope in all of their rifling through my stuff that they happen to take a glance at one of the booklets, and if they kept one of the booklets, I wouldn't be too upset. I hope they did. I hope they... I didn't count them as I left how many I'd taken, but I hope they kept one and decided to read it. I hope they took a business card, too, so if they ever want to see the light and want to speak out... They know who to call. But I just wanted to share that little observation. My resolve is strengthened. I know why I'm in this fight. I know why I'm helping AE 9-11 Truth expose the crime of the century. And it all begins with local action like we're doing in this show here tonight. So I'm going to play my uh, me and Dale speech at the city council in Walnut Creek last week after our moment of silence. And then I'll play our interview. So before I play it, we'll do our moment of silence beginning now. And that's 10 seconds. Mr. Dale Pierce. Hello, I'd like to thank the City Council for making us feel very welcome here on such a painful subject. My name is Dale Pierce. I'm a veteran firefighter and a member of Lions Club International. I was hoping to show you a video of what is called World Trade Center 7 and the collapse of this building and how it affects us firefighters. On September 11th, A 47-story high-rise collapsed in under seven seconds. And if you look at this video, you can clearly see this was a controlled demolition. The problem is that NIST, the National Institute of Technology, has asserted that this building collapsed due to small office fires. If this is true, this presents a nightmare for us firefighters, as we couldn't even get near a building like this, let alone go inside of it, as the benefits would outweigh the the hazards of going to a building like this. And so I ask, how can we morally or ethically send our firefighters into this building? You'd have to understand this building would just about dwarf anything in San Francisco. It came down evenly, symmetrically, into its own footprint. And immediately, the metal that we should have been able to see how those, those joints and beams gave apart was taken to China and melted down. That's a federal felony, destruction of crime scene evidence. Even a small town, this affects our firefighters as they may be called into rotation to to help clean up such an event as on September 11th. 
<clears throat> this is causing a, divi a division affecting every firehouse across America on what to do about this problem. Some firehouses have even posted signs stating that we do not talk about September 11th because it's too painful to try to deal with this issue of exactly what happened. As a firefighter, I find it disturbing that our firefighters are left without a solution to this problem. More disturbing is the fact that the only reliable information that I have obtained is that, that fits the evidence is from a group called Architects and Engineers for 911 Truth, with over 2,300 architects and engineers that have studied the evidence of this collapse they have determined that indeed WTC-7 was brought down in a controlled demolition. Either way, firefighters need a solution to this monstrous problem. My ethical duty as a firefighter and as a concerned citizen has been fulfilled by passing on this very burdensome information to those of you who are responsible for the safety of our firefighters. Thank you. Sorry, next speaker is Andrew Steele. Yep, that's me. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Steele, and uh, I'm one of the writers of this book, Beyond Misinformation, What Science Says About the Destruction of World Trade Center Buildings 1, 2, and 7. Now, I'm here to bring to your attention a matter of grave importance to all Americans and certainly to fellow citizens in this community, just as Dale has. Fourteen years ago, our nation was forever changed by the attacks of September 11th. And since 9-11, a growing number of architects and engineers have been asking serious questions about how the towers in New York were brought down. So far, over 2,300 architects and engineers have signed a petition calling for Congress to reinvestigate this tower's destruction. These professionals question, in particular, how the third tower, World Trade Center 7, could have fallen. This building was not hit by an airplane, and as our government admitted in their official reports, the minor damage it sustained from the fall of the North Tower earlier in the day was not significant enough to cause the collapse in the late afternoon. This third building, it fell straight down symmetrically at free fall acceleration for 105 feet in the exact manner of a classic controlled demolition. All right, a skyscraper can only fall symmetrically at free fall acceleration if every one of its steel columns is synchronistically removed floor by floor, and this feat can only be accomplished by explosives. Yet NIST, the agency tasked with investigating the destruction of the towers, claimed that Building 7 came down merely due to normal office fires. All right, office fires have never brought down any steel frame skyscraper before or after September 11th, because they can't. Okay. As well, this investigation omitted important structural features present in Building 7 that would have prevented NIST's collapse hypothesis from even happening. So they left out parts of the building, to put it bluntly, to make their scenario happen. All right. This isn't conspiracy theory, regardless of what the media tells you. This is science. This is common sense. So I'm therefore asking the city council to adopt the following resolution. On behalf of the citizens of Walnut Creek, we, the City Council, call for a truly independent investigation with subpoena power to uncover the full truth surrounding the complete destruction of World Trade Center Building 7. This investigation would include a full inquiry into the possible use of explosives, which might have been the actual cause of this building's destruction. And even though this resolution is symbolic, it can act as a wake-up call to the residents of this town and to the rest of our nation. Because we as Americans have a civic duty, even a moral obligation to demand a reinvestigation of this building's destruction and to seek accountability from our government on this issue. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. I see none. Thank you very much, Mr. Steele. Thank you. Dale Pierce is a veteran firefighter and the head of AE 911 Truth's firefighter outreach team. He's been a guest on the show in the past. Well, he's back today to talk about the latest stuff that he's been up to. I've been involved in it with him, too. So uh, we, we talked about it a little bit last week. But, Dale, thanks for coming back on 911 Freefall. Good to be here, Andy. All right, so we've talked about this in the past on previous shows. It began with Marvin Sanis, and now it's becoming a phenomenon. Uh, we got the city council project going on. I'm going to let you tell the story, set it up for the listeners. What did we do last week? 
We went before city council because what I've discovered through talking to our firefighters, like Rudy Dent, that the city council is the weak link in their armor. The uh, chain of command goes from the president down to the the governors on into the mayors, and it's the mayor that's responsible for the safety of citizens in high-rise buildings and their firefighters. And even in a small town, firefighters can be rotated in to an event like September 11th if need be. You know, they'll start with, for instance, Seattle had firefighters rotating into the pile. So going before city council and explaining the situation that firefighters are in, that this World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed in six and a half seconds. I mean, that's a fact. And the only official document we have to go on as firefighters is the NIST report stating that they asserted the building fell down due to small office fires. So if that's the case, how can we morally or ethically send a firefighter into a building that's going to collapse like this? So my first speech before you spoke was specifically on that, asking the mayor and the city council, explaining the building, and then asking them, how can we send a firefighter in there if it's going to crash? The only official document we have is from NIST. But looking at my research, the only evidence that I see that that fits the evidence we've seen is from architects and engineers, from 911 Truth. And then I told them about the uh, obviously controlled demolition of World Trade Center building. And that at that point, you could see the audience separated into those that uh, are going to believe the official story and those were just their mouths hit the ground realizing, wow, <laughs> it's in our face. So that's what it's about. It's about to bring this issue right into their their den, and that's the city council, of how are you going to protect our firefighters? We have to make a decision. Do we red tag these buildings like we should and figure out how they collapsed, or do we uh, continue on in basically what's a dereliction of duty? So that's where we're at with this. Well, it was a great experience. It's something that I think everybody should share in, and of course we got the knockout punch, the right and the left, you and me coming in at the same time, and we're going to be touring the entire Bay Area here, uh, coming to a city council near you if you live around here. But it doesn't need to be limited to just the Dale and Andy show. It can be the Joe or Harry or Beth or Susan or whatever show, whoever out there who's listening to this show. Uh, knows about the evidence of 9-11, the fact that the buildings in New York were brought down in controlled demolitions, who wants to do something to help. We put out the action alert a month ago, uh, asking our supporters to go out and do this. The script is already written for you. The video is already right there for you to be uh, downloading and playing before your city council. So uh, all the work is pretty much done. You just got to show up and read it. As simple as that. Easy to do to wake up others and share with them the crime of the century. This is how word traveled back in the old days. People talk about the revolution and the revolution of ideas that's happening now. They compare the two things, uh, what happened 200 years ago to uh, what's going on today. And this is how people had to share information is by word of mouth, by going to town halls and reading statements. I mean, people didn't hear about the Declaration of Independence from the Internet back in... To, back in the, the 1700s, someone had to come to the town square and read it to them or have it printed in the newspaper. So this is how we're going to wake people up, and it takes it out of that matrix of the Internet where things are becoming more and more tightly controlled. Uh, I love this idea. That's why I'm going with you to all of these places and happy to be uh, participating in this effort. And then people might think it sounds small. People might think... You know, what is my city council going to be able to do? But just having that conversation, creating that friction wherever you can is going to have a major impact. And you better believe that the other side doesn't like that we're doing this. Uh, so what, how did you feel about the reactions of the people in the room when we went in there? Beyond, beyond what you've already said, what was the kind of feeling you were getting as we uh, each of us spoke in front of, those, uh, in front of that crowd of like maybe 50 or so people? It was an extremely a varied reaction uh, a lot of most of the people were just simply deer in headlights one of the women on the city council was absolutely stunned and, and realized that this is the real issue the mayor was just almost disgusted and the police were you could definitely feel the vibes in there of uh, being a firefighter I didn't realize how the 
blue coat of silence drifts over into firefighters. And I think when George Bush got on the pile and, and had his photo op with the firefighters, that sealed the deal with firefighters on going with the official story regardless of how you have to warp reality to make that fit. So dealing with these firefighters and, and over the years, I've, I've uh, realized that they're really, uh, even as alpha as we are to go in these buildings, they submit to authority. So the crowd was, was split, and I just remember this one detective was looking at me like, he was just so disgusted, he was absolutely outraged that I would get up there in his city council and do that. And by the time you got up there, I was worried he might have to tase you. I mean, he was really upset over us. So we are going to have an impact, and if we can film this and the reaction, for instance, when Marvis Santos, Santos, excuse me, first did this in Portland, the city council was uh, scattered. They were trying to blow him off as just a nut. And I showed that to two mothers that knew September 11th was basically a controlled demolition, but they didn't know anything about Building 7. That outraged them. But when they saw the reaction of the, the city council just not paying attention to Marvin, they really got angry, and they wanted to go in and ask them, what's up with ignoring this man giving you this vital information where all these wars started? So I feel that... Us going in there and showing an example of we can just simply ask these questions. The city council invites you in. They're very friendly. They'll let us upload our video if we give them plenty of time. So this is going to separate who loves this country and who doesn't. It's going to be right there in front of everybody. For instance, the city councilwoman that was really amazed by our speeches and paying it minute de detail to it saw her colleagues just simply blowing us off. So... I suspect the next uh, party they have or social meeting should be uh, quite interesting. I think we're going to spice things up, Andy. Yeah, and you have a very valid point, and this is something that I want to drive home with the audience and express because this is uh, a major important reason why we need to be reaching out to city council is because it does relay. As you said, that firefighters can be rotated into major urban areas that do have steel frame high-rises in them. So even if you live in uh, you know, Walnut Creek, uh, California, you can still be rotated somewhere, maybe even to San Francisco, which does have high-rises. Uh, and the new reality that Nest has crafted with their flimsy explanation for what happened to Building 7 is that office fires and a few thermally expanding beams can bring these high-rises down in mere seconds. That is a safety hazard for firefighters who would be happen to be in these buildings fighting the fires at that time. That's not a good thing. So now we have to deal with this new reality that NIST has created or possibly acknowledge the actual reality, which is the evidence that Building 7 was brought down in a controlled demolition on 9-11. So you can't just ignore the entire thing. You either got to deal with one aspect or the other. You got to deal with one story or the other. And if you want to buy the lie, now you've got to deal with the insane safety hazard that's been created by this. So this is absolutely applicable to city councils because they oversee the fire chiefs in their own uh, you know vicinities and have to uh, you know deal with this reality. They have to figure out how to protect their firefighters and how can anybody stand against firefighter safety? Because that's what you're standing against when you refuse to even look at Building 7. When you refuse to deal with the reality that NIST has crafted for us, you are standing against protecting our firefighters. And that's not a good thing either. So that's the corner that the politicians have been painted into and why I think this is so uh, important and applicable for the 9-11 Truth Movement to go to city council and address. You can't have your cake and eat it too. What do you have to say about that, Dale? Yeah, absolutely. When you take September 11th down to the very fine essence of what it means, you can argue about the Pentagon or, or Flight 11. It just goes on and on. They can always squeeze out. But when it really comes down to it is how can we send a firefighter into a building that's going to behave like that? We can't. So at that point, there's no arguing against this. It's, it's indefensible to try to take us out. You can't protect the firefighters. So at this point, that is when people will start to warp reality. And believe me, I've heard it. All, everything from 
hey, you're a firefighter. You knew the risk when you went in there. You know, too bad if those buildings fall on you. I mean, it's it's not a pretty picture once you go this direction. Another gentleman said, uh, you know, oh, nobody got hurt in Building 7, so it, it's no news uh, worthy at all. So, yeah, it, you can't... De- you can't argue against this. It's just indefensible. So we've got a very potent weapon. How are we going to protect these firefighters? And beyond that, just the fact that the building can fall down. You know, this is a, a, a serious penetration. You've got a plane hit. You've got collapsed floors. You've got stuff on fire. And you've got to penetrate into this. Doing your job and making sure everyone gets in safe, everyone does what they're trained to do is hard enough to think that this building now might fall down on you could start panic attacks among firefighters one of the leading deaths of firefighters on the job is heart attack they live a pretty stressful life they're away from home finances aren't always that great for them starting out it's very stressful they show up on a fire and they're maxed out and they drop dead of heart attacks happened to a friend of mine just before his retirement so That's an issue. You know, after I left the fire service, I became trained in saturation diving, worked offshore on the oil rigs. And let me tell you, when you drop down on the bottom of the ocean and penetrate into the legs of an oil rig and into the Christmas tree, you've got to know this thing's not going to crash down on you. It's stressful enough with everything that goes on in those conditions. You've got to be dead certain. And when those firefighters went into those World Trade Centers, they had a thoroughly scientific plan to go in all the furnishings were fireproof it was made to take multiple hits by the 707 they would go in there and put out whatever pockets of fire whether it's just purses and jackets and paper and storage like that but everything in that building even the coasters for the furniture had to be fireproof it could not burn so there was a a dead scientific plan how the firefighters were going to go in there and the building gave out and there's just so many more issues. We need we need more people to come in and just wherever you dig in September 11th, you find just unbelievable stories. For instance, as soon as the firefighters came after the collapse, they started handing out masks, and those were the wrong size. Now, we've lost over 1,000 firefighters due to the cancers, and it's really difficult having close friends that have were on the pile and, you know, it's 15 years later, and this is when the cancers start popping up. And you just worry, you know, is my friend going to get this? It's not fair to anyone. And I understand that there's an organization that's trying to get the health care coverage back for 72,000 people that circulated on those piles using the, the wrong size mask. And to this day, that hasn't been rectified. So I gave a speech the other day in a, a meeting. What I've been doing is meeting our mayors in our local cities and I go to everywhere that they go and I see who their friends are and then I give a speech on firefighter safety issues and then I get people coming up to me that inform me hey don't you know it was a controlled demolition so we hook up and when I find the mayor's friends I gather them so when we go before city council his friends will be right there with us. So these are the things we need to do. Right. And, you know, this notion that no firefighters died in Building 7 so we shouldn't care about it uh, is absolutely ludicrous because, I, you know, my, I personally believe the reason they were pulled out of there is they just watched the first two controlled demolitions and people were spooked. Um, you know, and, and you know, I know there's talk about some engineer told them this or, or that, but, uh, I mean, I, this was the first time I'd ever heard of, of firefighters being spooked to put out a fire in a building, and there's no reason that uh, that they couldn't control these fires. In fact, they were pulled out before the fires had even reached the corner where the collapse allegedly initiated. And we have to look at the reality that we've been left with because in another event, would you just have random office fires taking place inside a high-rise, firefighters can be inside the building, and again, within seconds, this thing is on top of them. So now there is a serious safety hazard that we have to deal with. If you want to believe the official story, again, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the official story is correct and not deal with this firefighter issue. 
All right. So this is the best way to go. Uh, it's absolutely why city councils need to be involved in looking at this. It's why city councils need to be looking at the deeper issues with the investigation. Uh, rerun the analysis with the proper structural features included that were left out in the analysis, which would have stopped NIST collapse initiation hypothesis from even happening. It seems like they should do a thorough investigation if we're going to hang our hat on this thing, right? Uh, release the input data on Building 7, as Richard Gage said when he was on C-SPAN. You know, not releasing this data makes the public less safe, because architects and engineers need this information to make the building safer. So let's just, let's just drink that Kool-Aid for just one moment, and we'll pretend that physics stood down on 9-11, and say the official story is correct. How are you going to deal with the firefighter safety issue? How do you prevent... Uh, another steel frame high rise like Building 7 from collapsing while firefighters are inside now this time battling the fires. Yeah, you can feel the the value of that argument for the simple reason you're not putting them in shock right away. You're showing the mayor and the city council and other firefighters and the police and everyone else in that room that, look, this is about our responsibility to our firefighters. How do we deal with this? Because if we just simply go in there and, and try our normal, you know, as a controlled demolition, you, you just simply, everyone just shuts down. This way, they, we, we bring them in emotionally, and then hopefully we're harvesting the 4% that uh, we could expect to get out of crowds. So bring them in emotionally, and then bring the facts on like what we did. I came in with a firefighter speech, you followed up with the controlled demolition, and that was a very powerful first beginning. So this little tour we're going to do of 40 cities will take some time. They're only, uh, you know, every one of these meetings is either a Monday or Tuesday every other week. So it's going to take us some time. But uh, we're going to gain some valuable experience and hope we can film it and show the reactions of the, the crowd and city council and get other people to start joining us. In between, I go to Toastmasters. I go to Lions Clubs. I give my firefighter safety speech, and it brings in more and more connections where – before, when I was just coming in with the controlled demolition, it was really, really tough to get anywhere. You couldn't speak in public. But when you come in, hey, this building fell down, and how are we going to send a firefighter in? You can get out your smartphone and show people, and all of a sudden, you've got a crowd of people supporting you. So this is the beginning, and uh, as we move on, it's just going to get better and better, especially with some of the talent we have joining us. Right. Now, you mentioned about taping your speech. Why do you feel it's important to tape your speech? One, we can uh, show people how easy it is and document it. I mean, we're actually going in there and notifying the mayor that he has a serious issue with his firefighters. And we are notifying him that these are the facts. And my obligation of a firefighter has now been solved by giving you this information. In other words, I leave the ball in his court. How are you going to respond? Are you going to protect our firefighters? Here's the building that fell down. And if the event happens and he loses some firefighters, um, boy, that should be interesting in court. Historians are going to love this. Someday historians will be going through these tapes and go, oh, my God, look at that. It's right there. They're watching the building fall down, and they're thinking about golf or, you know, throwing a hissy fit because it doesn't fit what's on Fox News. It's going to be very powerful, these images we catch of people that are in dereliction of duty. That's all I can say. They, don't, they do not have a plan to go into the buildings. We were guaranteed the World Trade Center towers would not collapse. They did. We were guaranteed buildings like number seven were safe through earthquakes, hurricanes, and fires, and it crumbled due to small office fires, not even a raging fire. It's just uh, the, the questions can go on and on and on. And I can see the day where uh, people would be going before city council and foreman mayor if you don't either red tag these buildings and evacuate them or figure out how they fell down. You need to resign and get somebody in there that can do that. So this can get ugly. They're in dereliction of duty. As a firefighter, you these guys are getting written up for getting to put toilet paper in the bathroom. And here we have this incident, and no one's being held accountable. There's no plan to protect our firefighters so as we go into city councils we're only going to get better at relaying this message to them having it on youtube will just be our way of documenting this for the public 
Right, it puts them on notice, it captures their reaction, and uh, again, there's no way that they can avoid this conflict of logic because it's either a controlled demolition or you believe that small office fires can completely bring down a steel frame high-rise in only seconds. I mean, what is our plan if a, if a high-rise catches on fire in New York City again in the future? Are we supposed to just have the firefighters stand outside and watch the building come down? Are we supposed to, if, we, if one catches on fire here in San Francisco, are we supposed to just watch it and say, oh, there goes that one. Oh, that looked pretty in the skyline. I guess it's going to go down now. Or just let it burn, and if it doesn't go down, just let it burn all night until it just leaves a skeleton, which is what would happen because if, if it's a steel frame high rise. Um, but you can't justify sending firefighters in there if you have that kind of hazard taking place. And it just captures their reactions, as we've done or, or mentioned so many times before, just like with the C-SPAN campaign where people would call in and ask the congressman very specific questions and get called a conspiracy theorist for it. History's watching. I think of time as existing sometimes and all at the same time, not to get philosophical here. And at some point... There is a future young person doing a report on the insane people of America in this time of history and how uh, America collectively turned a blind eye. Not every single member of it, not Dale Pierce, not Andy Steele, not Richard Gage, but many people who were in the positions of power to do something about it chose not to. And if we can catch somebody, you know, looking, shuffling through papers, looking away from the screen while the video plays. Uh, and uh, catch them on, on tape, then they're recorded in history. Now, with the local groups, you mentioning other ones before, like Toastmasters, Lions Club, other fraternal organizations, how do they play a role in all of this? I mean, what can local groups that are concerned about this issue do to get the word out about Building 7, controlled demolition, or just the firefighter safety issues that uh, we've been left with as a result of the official story? Oh, there's so much they can do, from Odd Fellows to the Red Man Society. All of them seem to have a, a public service statement and a code of ethics. Uh, Lion, or, uh, uh, Toastmasters can be a great venue for people to go in three times to reach club free and just learn the basics of speaking so you could visit one of these three times, lose your ahs and uhs, and learn the basics of speaking, go before a city council, read the speech, and you've done your duty. You know, you've done a huge thing. Organizations like Lions Club have a very strict code of ethics. So things like the Blue Code of Silence, for instance. Um, if lying under oath or whatever, please do and not report one another, is unethical, you know, why are these guys in Lions Club? Why aren't we enforcing some of this stuff? That's what it really comes down to, is we don't have any steel to actually look at and prove controlled demolition or, you know, thermal expansion, because it was all taken to China and melted down. The biggest collapse, structural catastrophe in our ever, and you take all the steel and melt it down and come up with the excuse, well, we don't have any steel to look at. Well, that's a federal felony. That's destruction of crime scene evidence. And now we're, you're telling me that my son died in Iraq or the result of Iraq because we didn't do a thorough investigation, got into these wars, and now Building 7 crops up? How are these families going to feel that with 22 soldiers every day committing suicide, how are they going to feel about this, Building 7 and the, the metal taken and, and melted down? You know, uh, Andy, if that was you and me had a house and the fire, ch the there was film of molten metal coming into that thing and it fell down, you'd mean be in handcuffs before we, the fire was even put out. This didn't happen with these people, so it's uh, you know, it's it's unfair that uh, the rich get treated one way and we the other. This is a blatant, obvious. What do you say? Uh, uh, it's unjust. It's unjust. I mean, you you add, you put it add on to your house, and you've got the town wanting to fine you if you don't get permission, and all this all these hoops you got to jump through just to make home improvements in many parts of the country. And here you got this forty seven story steel frame high rise collapsing and allegedly collapsing in seven seconds because of a fire, and 
uh, collectively, government, people who should care about this, look the other way. A lot of architects and engineers don't even know about Building 7. And as I've said on the show before, that's like uh, doctors not knowing about the Black Plague. I mean, it's significant. It's an important event in the history of engineering, of structural engineering and architecture. Yeah, you know, working offshore... Those oil rigs are incredible. Some of them come up out of a thousand foot of water. They're just like a windmill with a platform up on top. But uh, the current, the hurricanes, everything they go through, the corrosion, and still, when you get down there with a broco cutting rod that cuts at ten thousand degrees, it is a job to get through, you know, inch plate steel. And when you look at John Gross on this pile of evidence here, with that grin on his face, looking at you know, high heat corrosion, he should be looking extremely concerned, like, what is this, instead of grinning, like, look, Mom, this is amazing. He's sitting on evidence like this, yet you show this to firefighters, and they immediately turn their head and look away. They just, they will not look at the evidence. So going before city council and being able to show a picture of John Gross in this beam, the metal flowing out of the building, the building collapsing, is going to have an unbelievable effect. And we're filming that for the rest of the world to see. And someday their, their grandchildren will be asking them, what did you do in the, during the war on terror, Mommy and Daddy? Yeah, and this is the real war on terror, the one that we're fighting. The real war on the, on the uh, terror on the American public psyche. Uh, with this lie of the official story that we're trying to undo. It's funny, I, I had to travel across the country over the week, and I had to go through TSA, and it was an absolute nightmare. I won't even go into the details of it here because I chose the pat down, and they, I mean, they pat you down. They, the, the, the stuff that the people are saying about it, uh, they're not kidding. It's just invasive, and they do it deliberately to try to make an example of you because you had the audacity to opt out. I really believe that. That's my own personal opinion. And, uh, you know, just while I'm going through this and I'm watching him search some little old man in a wheelchair right next to me who is all hunched over and, and barely coherent. This guy must have been 90 years old. I mean, yeah, they, they got a suspicious one there. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking, wow, how interesting would they find it to know that a lot of this is based on a lie? I mean, what would they do? What would happen overnight? This stuff would end overnight if we if we got it acknowledged. <laughs> that these buildings in New York were brought down in controlled demolitions. Because it would change the whole face of what we're fighting, or what we think we're fighting here in America. The real the real war on terror is the one that me and Dale are fighting right now. Yeah, it was amazing. I tried to call you, and the cell phones don't work at altitude. But yet on September 11th, they worked for 29 minutes, breaking all protocol of what flight attendants do. So where were those phone calls made? You know, as firefighters, we show up when... Uh, most unexpected. You know, something happened, something caused that fire, and there's a, a lot of times there's a liability. So we have our own detectives. We're trained in crime scene prevention. So we can go outside of the realm of just what caused a controlled demolition. We can actually wonder who did it and how they did it and on and on. So we look, you know, further into it, and we look into the airlines and such, and it's just amazing looking at the whole circle here of, of possibility who, who benefited from this, but how did they make those, those phone calls from those planes? They had to be on the ground. So it is an advantage being a firefighter. We can go further into the exploration and talk about it. But uh, it's scary ground, but when you really look at it, Andy, you couldn't make a phone call now. How could they do it then? And those phone calls lasted up to 29 minutes. And the main thing they did was to assert that it was Middle Eastern terrorist. City Council, you know, and with all this in the background, these people just, it's like an overload fuse box. They just, they just pop. But when we go in there and start talking about firefighter safety and what I'm doing by making friends with everybody around that mayor to agree we got to protect our firefighters, then we bring in professional engineers and architects to explain it. They really don't have much to stand on. I agree with you. And now, how do you, how helpful do you think the role of the Beyond Misinformation booklet is, is going to be in this process? It's going to be stunning. Uh, for instance, I'm looking at the page with John Gross there in that big beam, and that's going to be the first thing I show the mayor when uh, we start talking more on this issue. He's agreed to let me meet the local fire chief, and 
I want to educate him before we have that meeting with the fire chief. The last fire chief that I met with got a little angry looking at the evidence, and he blurted out that when the plane hit, it was equivalent to a hydrogen bomb. So I had to correct him that, uh, you know, professionally speaking, you are off by about 150 million degrees. So, yeah, they will warp reality and let them do it in city council. We're uh, we're filming them. That's all I can say. Uh, You know, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's helpful to be able to hold it up and show examples, show the colorful pictures in there, be able to study it and take notes yourself to kind of consolidate it to one sheet of paper if you're in a spot or you want to talk to professionals and you can cite these points without having to have it completely committed to memory. Uh, jot you know, jot your mind on uh, off the paper is what I'm what I mean. Um, now, what are some of the things to consider before going to your city council? Like things that we wish we had thought about before we went to uh, the city council last week. Uh, logistics. If you're if you know your city, you know where to park. But if not, like we're going to these different cities, find your parking, find a place to rendezvous if it's two of you, like we did. Contact them early so you can uh, get your video in there. You know, maybe if you're good enough, you could even do some still shots like uh, John Gross with his uh, famous beam shot there. And uh, I would, you know, go to Toastmasters. I mean, my God, my dad fought in World War II. He went through Utah Beach and through the Hurricane Forest where we lost 38,000 men. 10,000 of them died from basically trench foot, freezing to death in their, their trenches as the bullets were flying, and we wouldn't even give them the honors of dying in combat, called it trench foot. When I think about that and the French resistance, all we have to do is meet at a pizza shop and, and give a three-minute speech and can cause the other side so much damage. This is um, – what a way to fight a battle. Yeah. I mean, again, and then we broadcast it all over the Internet, and people hopefully pass it around and, and see it and learn from the example and go ahead and do it themselves. That's what I'd like to see happen. It's not that hard to do. It's actually really easy. The hardest part was finding a parking space. Really, that was the hardest part. And now we didn't get our video pre-approved, and we so that's why it didn't show over there in Walnut Creek. Uh, we will make sure we don't have that problem in the future. But overall, it was good. You know, and the speech stands alone, even if you don't have the capabilities to show a video too, because people can look it up later. Uh, you want to try to have the video. Yeah, it's, uh, you saw how emotional it is in there. Some of these city councils are a real slugfest at the at the podium. There's a lot of anger towards city council sometimes. They make incredible, powerful decisions. And, like, we had that gentleman in there that basically just, you know, pooed and pawed the whole time and made a fool of himself. But if these guys could... If they want to cause some issues, I mean, to learn our speech and go in there, wow, the passion we would have, because the, the city council is full of these people. You saw after I gave my speech, I sat down, and one of the attorneys looked at me and gave me a thumbs up, and uh, he took one of the Beyond Misinformation, and there was several others in there. Yeah, they're architects and engineers. They were talking about some water issue. They were talking about some structure having to do with the water. I didn't pay attention really deeply at that moment. I was thinking about what we were going to do. But uh, but there were actually happened to be architects and engineers in the room as well when we were talking about this, and I didn't see what their reactions were. Maybe they were thinking about their own issue. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but you know that's outreach to other A's and E's as a result of what we're doing. Yeah, and don't forget that was broadcast on Comcast, and then it was played again on Saturday. It's in their archives. This is going to spread around. There's going to be some people that uh, see it and just start sharing it on Facebook. Um, it could just simply start to go viral. I mean, hopefully there's enough people that get it and love our country enough to actually take this stuff and run with it. I know every day that I turn someone's life upside down because they just simply get it, just like the woman on the city council. She got it. It was a head-slapping moment. Yeah, and, you know, doing this, this is another aspect I don't know if we've really touched on in this interview, but the fact that it gets on public access a lot of the time. Uh, These city council meetings are broadcast, and... They might be things that people might be flipping by the 
flipping through the channel and, and not watch, but some people take an interest in this. you would be amazed at how many people are interested in what goes on at City Hall because City Hall does have the most uh, direct impact to your life. If you want a pothole filled that's been haunting your driveway as you pull out to drive to work in the morning, who are you going to go to? You're going to go to City Hall, right? They're the people who can actually do something about it, not Barack Obama. So... Uh, some people follow this and are very deeply interested in it for whatever reason. If it's just, you know, they're passing the time, they're bored, or if there's a specific issue that they're trying to follow. And you're reaching out to them and you're getting on the television set. And if you can get a video playing and that gets on TV, someone will be flipping through the channels and see someone showing a building coming down, Building 7, and stop and pause and say, what's this about? So you get on TV and sometimes they'll do your work of taping you for you. Absolutely, and the way we're hitting it, every city is going to be unique. We've got uh, cities that are displaying some of the metal. We've got, for instance, where you're at Lafayette, there's about 7,000 crosses on the freeway marking all the deaths from Iraq and Afghanistan. As a firefighter, I can go in there and adapt my speech to fit that particular situation and then introduce you. So... It's going to give us a lot of different variations of speeches, a lot of experience, and calling them out. Um, for instance, Martinez has some of the steel on display. You don't have to be a, a, a metallurgist to see that this would have what I would call high heat distortion. In other words, the metal, you could see it got really hot. And then there, during the collapse, something hit this metal and broke it through. It was five-eighths thick. And you could see, instead of a rip, the edges had rounded off, just like it was white hot when that damage happened. So being able to speak about that and actually maybe take a picture of this damage and then show it at city council is really going to have an effect. Um, New York, for instance, we could uh, adapt a speech for the fact that that engineer apparently came up and stated, oh, Building Seven's going to fall over pretty soon. You've got about five hours. Well, that's new information, and that's dereliction of duty if, that fired up, if New York City is not sharing this in- engineer's knowledge of pre-collapse in a high-rise that was supposed to withstand all that. Before the fire reached the area of collapse initiation. Yeah, exactly. Five hours before, <laughs> they're telling them, you've got about, you know, an engineer. So that engineer needs to be sharing with all other fire departments, Right. And then Chief Negro claimed that, yeah, because of that uh, call that, you know, uh, the building was going to collapse, we roped it off and stopped rescue operations. So we don't know if people died. If they stopped rescue operations, who's to say there weren't people trapped in there? Barry Jennings was trapped for a while. So all of a sudden, how are we going to offer fire protection, let alone keep our citizens safe, if they're just going to collapse through these fires? They're going to be trapped and die and... What was one of the recommendations they said? They should put more exits on these buildings. Well, that means firefighters need parachutes. Well, yeah, the whole thing's ridiculous. And, of course, you know, these firefighters, as I mentioned before, just watched the two towers come down. It was a terrifying morning, I imagine, for them. Uh, now you got somebody, and I, I don't know who who what this identity of this engineer is, saying that oh this one, other one's going to come down too, get him out of there. Obviously the fire chief doesn't want to lose more men. Of course they're going to rope it off, and they watch the building come down, right? But at this same time, uh, you know there, there's no reason that anyone should have expected that this building should come down. So this engineer needs to be questioned. And if this is indeed what happened, if we want to really believe that and drink that Kool-Aid, we got this reality that we have to deal with, that city councils have to deal with, even if they're in small towns, because as you said before, they can be rotated into the big cities that do have these uh, major high-rise fires occasionally. And when one happens, go ahead. Yeah, it's really sad, but you got to realize they planned the controlled demolition, and they couldn't allow a 1,000 firefighters to witness this, so... They had to to neutralize the fire department, and it's pretty obvious when you start looking at the the track of what happened to the firefighters that day. Just before then, they were given radios that weren't field tested, so when the North Tower collapsed, the police all heard the uh, call to get out. The firefighters didn't. So who's responsible for those radios? Hmm. As we know, the Twin Towers were designed not to fall. They did. 
when rescue workers showed up to do rescue, they were given the wrong size mask. Now I can tell you as a commercial diver, we've got mountains of evidence on how to purify air. There's no excuse for that. To lose all those firefighters was an additional 72,000 injured. And then what was really interesting, I saw where uh, they did the right thing and they gave these firefighters therapy. You know, after such an event, you've got a lot of trauma. You had 343 pass alarms sounding off from the firefighters that died, and those things wailed until their batteries died. You know, this is a lot of trauma. So I did an investigation on the, the therapy they gave them, and it was called critical stress, uh, what was it again, uh, critical incident stress debriefing. And just a little bit of uh, exploration and uh, investigation, and I realized this is the wrong therapy. This would enhance the trauma they went through. So what it is, we've got a whole lot of firefighters with hidden PTSD. They think they've been treated, and they don't. Now, something interesting with uh, my son, after serving two tours in Iraq, I read a small little article, you know, in the way back of the New York Times about thousands and thousands that were given water directly out of the Tigris River, had little squiggly things, depleted uranium, sewage from the plants we bombed, and that doesn't happen by accident. And the same thing, those soldiers were given the wrong therapy. None of these issues have been talked about. None of them have been dealt with. They could do it again. And America has decayed into three seasons, football, baseball, and basketball. Well, we have issues like this going on. So, yeah, if the city council wants to work with us, it'll be absolutely terrific. If not, um, we will give them a spanking all the way into history. It's the only way I can say it as a firefighter. Now, for people who want to do some follow-up after their city council speech, you just want to focus maybe on one town um, and then follow through and, and see if they can actually get the resolution that we asked them to pass, uh, you know, a symbolic call for a new investigation into Building 7. What are some of the things that people can do to follow up after they give the speech? Start going everywhere where there's political uh, situa- uh, meetings. Go to Lions Club. Go to, well, those aren't political, but any, any type of meeting. I go to business meetings. I go to where the mayors are going to be hanging out. I go to, to anything that's available to me and start making contacts. And you can make incredible progress by just being a concerned citizen about Building 7 and our firefighters' safety. That's a nice family-friendly discussion here without bringing up scary conspiracies and such. So I start off with that, and I would encourage them to uh, start taking notes of everyone that you have in that town and then possibly have a showing and start organizing. Go business to business. Go to farmer's markets. Anywhere and everywhere and start organizing. And then, like I did, I started making friends with the mayor I would watch it, who his friends were, make friends with them, find the truthers, and then get them to support me when we go to city council. So beyond just going and giving the speech, I'm building a coalition to, uh, to help support us. So those, those are simple things. They're all uh, social, so they can be fun. Doing the firefighter safety issues makes it an uh, uh, easier conversation than coming right in with the conspiracy it's a two-step two process is what we're looking at. Absolutely. I mean, people need to be active in their communities. And as I said before, being in the local city councils, uh, having a voice there is meaning having a voice in the body, the legislative body that has the most direct impact on your life, on everything happening around you. And this is the proper way to go. This is how things used to be done in America. Follow through. Get to know the people that are in these offices. You can actually – look, your, your local mayor, unless you live in New York City, are not protected by five bodyguards and suits and sunglasses with uh, earpieces, you know, and radios in their ears. It's somebody that probably also owns the local hardware store or uh, you know, works at the local GE office or, or whatever. They're people that you can reach. I mean, back when I lived in upstate New York, uh, the town mayor was a neighbor of my family's. So you can talk to them. You can uh, The person who was running for mayor who wanted his job was my mechanic, a good friend of mine. So 
uh, these people are, are within reach. You can reason with them. You can talk to them. And this is how things happen from the grassroots. This is the essence of the grassroots. Uh, what are some other audiences that people could give a similar speech to? They've done city council. They're excited about the thought, the prospect of this. Where else can you go uh, and, and try to get an audience of similar-minded people to the city council that you can talk about Building 7 to locally? Once again, uh, Toastmasters is terrific. They let you in three times for each club for free. For instance, we've got over 160 in the Bay Area, so we'll be hitting some of those up along with city councils. Lions Club is an excellent venue if you keep it to firefighter safety issues, and then you harvest the people that are in the know from, from those clubs. They'll, they'll come up to you and, 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 and hook up, and they're extremely helpful. There's so many other clubs, anywhere you can go, Rotary, you name it. Uh, farmers markets are huge. That's a very open-minded uh, crowd that's usually been too busy to pay attention, and I'm getting fabulous results. For instance, I've been invited into what's called the ACE program. It's the for uh, high school and junior high school kids that are interested in architectural construction and engineering. So that's an incredible venue. The city has lots of times booths out there. I met the uh, lead planning commissioner. He wants us to do a, uh, a showing. He'll bring in his buddies. All these people want our book. It just goes on and on. Anywhere we can get out. When you come in with the firefighter safety, start off with that first. You can have a, a logical, growing discussion that will bring people in. The problems I had going in with uh, the controlled demolition was just it, you burn out really quick, especially if you're dealing in the realm of firefighters, police, and city council members. Talk to your friends, get leads, have parties, whatever it takes, but we are fighting for our nation. This, uh, you know, Like I said, as a firefighter, we can look at who did it, why they did it, and I can only Warn us, son, too, stated, know thyself, know thy enemy, and never underestimate your enemy. We're letting them get away with this. If everyone just put in two hours, this thing would be over with. It's a very small group of people, but when you look at how they deceived us on September 11th using television, they created a, a complete illusion, and we fell for it. It wasn't much different than the War of the Worlds radio program that terrified the whole nation. They got away clean with that so far. They've had 15 years to realize we're on their trail. The Internet has changed everything. So what they have planned is probably not going to be pretty. We really don't know. We can only speculate. But we look what they did on September 11th. We know they had plans for people in the planes. We know they had plans for the firefighters. We know that the jumpers would... Uh, add to the drama. I mean, these people are masters. We aren't even playing checkers against someone that knows how to play chess on a world-class level. So we are fighting a battle. Do whatever you can. Join us. Facebook. Oh, boy, we could use people on Facebook because you can move simple information that we have on the Internet in front of everyone. City Council, the AIA, Everybody seems to want to have a Facebook page in these organizations, and right next to them is nine of their friends that you can send information to. So Facebook is going to be huge for those of us that don't want to go before crowds. We need everything you can think of. Those are words to end it by, and we're going to be taking this show on the road. We're going to hit as many cities as we can. We ask you to do the same. It's very simple, very easy. All you got to do is print out the speech, download the video, show it at your city council, read it at your city council, and that is it. That's the end of it. Go out and have a beer afterwards. Dale, I want to thank you for coming on 9-11 Freefall. Thank you, Andy. This program's on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also download MP3s of this show from the Internet Archive by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week. Good luck. <laughs>